Hey folks and welcome to another video from a plain truth.info. What I want to relate today is the ancients and their massive, massive buildings and carvings. We still can't figure out how they did it today with all our advanced technology. Here to the Nazca lines down in Peru with all their carvings on earth and straight lines of animals and whatnot that can only be seen from the sky. The pyramids, pyramid, the mid fire. Why did they build pyramids along sacred ley lines, energy lines all around the world? How did they know where these sacred energy sites were? We'll get into that at another time. But look at this architecture, folks. It was so highly advanced, we still can't figure out today. And what about underwater? Here off the coast of Mexico, off the coast of Japan, they have all these underwater cities and pyramids, which we'll get into in another video as well, about them being 150, 200, 300 feet underwater where life used to exist. Look at how huge these pyramids and stones perfectly carved are. How did they do it? Why did they do it? When did they do it? We have no idea today with all our alleged sophisticated advanced technology, we don't understand how they created many, many of the ancient wonders and we're not told about many of them. This is off the coast of Alexandria, Egypt, where they have many carvings of stones of ancient Egyptian gods and pharaohs as well. And then over to Lebanon and Belbek, where uh, they have a 1,242 ton carving in stone. 1,242 tons, but we have our modern-day Georgia Guidestones, which is talking about reducing humanity by some 95% from current levels. So let's get into the dolmens, the mega monoliths today, and look at them around the world. It's pretty fascinating, and again, we don't know how they did it. Behind me is the North Salem Dolmen, also called Balanced Rock. It's an incredible piece of work. It's a great granite boulder that's not from around here. It's like red granite or pink granite on top of some quartzite blocks, about six of them, but only really four of them it is actually resting on. It weighs between 60 and 90 tons. That's the estimation of it. And it sits up, up along this ridge where there's some kind of fault line going here and what's called a conductivity discontinuity but also below it is a negative magnetic anomaly so we can see that this is a very powerful site and when John Burke and his team tested it they found some remarkable results that it was a real energy center and would produce these sort of strange electric charge that was filmed and photographed and recorded by them uh, with their uh, very advanced technology they were using to, to record it Tests were carried out here by uh, John Burke in his book, Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty, where he placed some seeds here and when he went to grow them, the yield was much better and much stronger than, than samples that weren't placed uh, underneath the dolmen. So I googled and asked is what is the maximum weight a current modern day advanced technology scientific crane can lift? Maximum load that a crane can lift is 18 metric tons, about uh, 2019 uh, tons um, and uh, the crane cannot lift that much weight if the load is positioned at the end of the jib the closer the load is positioned to the mast the more weight the crane can lift you know and they got to use these huge monsters of cranes in order to lift some 20 19 20 tons all right and today I want to get into the dolmens uh, most of you are familiar with the Easter Island monoliths on the island there and you can see here that they've recently discovered that not only were they just heads on the island but they also have bodies when they excavated below uh, and as I said the largest crane today can lift 20 tons and here you see many more of these I'm not quite sure how many are in Easter Island 
but when you look at the stats on this, they're all monolithic. The carvings are created in one piece, an average weight of 20 tons. And they had to move them around the island. And they, like we showed in the picture here, they were very, very deep as well under the ground. Um, so how did they do it? Why did they do it? We don't know. With all our advanced technology, we don't know. All right, before we get into more of the dolmens, I just wanted to bring you this. This is called the Lysurgis Cup. And look at the details on this with King Lysurgis on the cover. This was found in Egypt. A colorful 16-year-old Roman chalice. Super sensitive to new technology. Well, it turns out that the Lysurgis Cup bears a scene involving King Lysurgis. Appears jade green, but is from, front, from the front blood red when lit being behind. The mystery was solved in 1990 when researchers in England scrutinized broken fa fragments under a microscope. The impregnated glass with particles of silver and gold ground down until they were small as 50 nanometers in diameter, less than one thousandth of the size of a grain of table salt. The mixture of the precious metals suggests the Romans knew what they were doing, an amazing feat. The ancient nanotechnology works something like this. When hit with light, electrons belonging to the metal flex vibrate in ways that alter the color depending on the observer's position, said an engineer in Illinois uh, who's long focused on using nanotechnology to diagnose disease. His colleagues realized that this effect offered untapped potential. The Romans knew how to make and use nanoparticulars for beautiful art. We wanted to see if they could have scientific applications. Energy, vibration, and frequency is what Nikola Tesla showed us. Uh, and I'm going to show you later Michael Tellinger showing us how they use levitation and other devices. But this, again, this uh, Lysurgis cup used nanotechnology of nanoparticulate size. All right, so let's get into the dolomites and the dolmens, dolmens large stone meaning. Uh, the site is ancient Atlantic megalith civilization. We'll go through a few of these. They're pretty incredible. All right, so here in the Karnak in England, um, Karnak is a highly charged place of telluric energy. Each stone taps in this energy, and together they provide tunnels or corridors of energy that charge you up as you walk through it. The Atlanteans were highly knowledgeable about the Earth's energy, and megaliths are almost always associated with these energies, a sort of acupuncture on the Earth for the benefit of both nature and man. Frequency, vibration, and energy. This is men here at Karnak have one flat side, one round side, making them polarized. Granite from which stones are made is high, also highly magnetic. The cut side is always on a north-south axis, and the stones have a pointed top. What appears to be a roughly cut stone always turns out to be a well-defined, premeditated form of which every, uh, form of stone, which every angle, shape, or slant has purpose. The hurlers at Bodmin Moor, South England. Um, they looked scattered. They couldn't figure out what it was about, but the wick lady told us that it was done on purpose, and outcroppings like this are like taps from which you can draw on Earth's energy. All right, this is a well-preserved and impressive chamber tomb with a dramatically sloping capstone. The capstone has a natural hole which pierces the stone at the highest point. This is an interesting one, La, La roche a fees in France, a large structure made of stone slabs, which many anti-chambers leading to a large uh, central chamber, Originally, it was covered with soil uh, with only the entrance showing. It was used for initiations. Let's get into that a little more. This is in France. Famous passage grave is said to be the largest dolmen in France, quite probably the best preserved of any of the dolmens in Europe. There are 40 huge stone slabs here. Neolithic period, they're saying between 3,000 and 5,000 years B.C. It was much earlier than that. The huge slabs of stone have a slight purple color. In fact, the stones are made of reddish basaltic schist that was queried some three miles from there. Three miles away, the passenger grave is 20 meters long, 65 feet, 13 feet wide, and 7 feet high. Some of the larger slabs and boulders weigh up to 40 tons, and they move them three miles, and they put them in these shapes. How did they do it, folks? How did they do it? Move them three miles and put them in these shapes? All right, look at how perfect the edges are there. We're going to see many, many more of these. There's dolmens in Korea. There's dolmens in Russia. Um, and here in Russia, in the Caucasus uh, region, the mysterious dolmens of the Caucasus, uh, Caucasus um, it's located 50 kilometers northeast of the Black Sea. 
Uh, again, 4,000 to 6,000 years old, which puts them about 4,000 to 2,000 BC. While there are tens of thousands of known dolmens throughout the world, throughout Europe, the Caucasian dolmens represent a unique type of prehistoric architecture built precise, with precisely dressed cyclopic stone blocks. The stones were shaped into 90 degree angles to be used as corners. Look at the corners here, folks. How did they carve it? How did they do this? And all there are punctuated with a portal in the center of the facade. Uh, facade. While round holes are the most common, square ones have also been found. Stone plugs have been found in almost every tomb and were used to block the portal of the front. Look at how perfectly they carved a round stone. How did they do it? And here you see more of them in circles forming it. Approximately 3,000 of these megalith monuments were known in the western Caucasus, but more are constantly being found. The average weight of each structure is from 15 to 30 tons. Remember we said the biggest crane can lift 20 tons? 15 to 30 tons. Yet there's not even the slightest trace of a quarry in western Caucasus. Nor have they any paths been found with evidence of heavy loads having been brought to the build site. How did they do it? We don't know. They were more advanced species back then. More intelligent humanity. We're seeing this over and over. All right, within the most of the dolmens, the huge stone plates join each other precisely with specially made grooves. The joint places are so close in places that it's impossible to even slide a knife blade between the plates. Despite the help of modern technology, the builders are unable to achieve the same level of precision as the Bronze Age stone builders. So we have dolmens in Korea. Look at these slabs, folks. How did they put them on top of there? How did they stick that heavy weight positioned on two upright stones like that? They have dolmens in Brazil, massive ones. Uh, stone circles in Gambia, Africa. They have dolmens in the United States, which I'll get into a, min into a minute. Uh, I should also mention the solid stone spheres. Over 300 have been found in Costa Rica. They've been found in clusters for up to 20 and offer in geometric patterns such as triangles, rectangles, or straight lines. Such alignments often point to the Earth's magnetic north. The spheres were made of granite, which as I mentioned before, is highly magnetic stone. Let's take a look at that. So here are the stone spheres of Costa Rica. Still considered a great unsolved archaeological mystery, the near-perfect ancient stones of Costa Rica were first found near the southern Caribbean, and hundreds of more have been found all over the country. All right, the stone spheres and hundreds of stone balls have been documented ranging in size from a few centimeters to over two meters in diameter. Some weigh 16 tons. Almost all of them are made of grandoriite, a hard, ingenious stone. These objects are monolithic sculptures made by human hands. How do they know this? The spheres are number over 300. The large ones weigh many tons. Unfinished spheres were never found. Like the monoliths of the old world, the Costa Rican quarry was more than 50 miles away from the final resting place of these mysteries. Weighing 16 tons, they move them 50 miles away. So, and also in Micronesia, uh, some 400,000 columns of basalt are stacked around 10 tons each. Stacked up form walls as high as 50 feet and as many as thick as 17 feet. It's built up on a coral reef. There are actually 80, actually 80 artificially built islands, artificially built. Uh, they decided to quarry 400,000 stone columns and stack them up. Why? We still don't know. So Nan Mundal is a city built on the coral reefs, one of the oldest archaeological sites. Not on the heritage list, but like Easter Island is an engineered marvel. Scrolling down, we see that uh, Nan, Ma Nan Madal is the main archaeological site in Oceania that is made up of huge rocks. Uh, they see very few visitors. Uh, here is a picture of it here, a man standing maybe six feet tall. You can see that's probably about 25, 30 feet high. Um, and we learn about the size of these that on a final stop in the Nandawans, by far the most elaborate building, its royal mortuary was two sets of 20-foot high walls, gracefully swept up corners, covering an area larger than a football field. One cornerstone alone is estimated to weigh 50, 50 tons. How did they do it? We don't know. All right, so a few more here. Uh, scrolling down, 
Um, these gigantic stones are in Peru. Um, uh, they consist of six enormous stone blocks, which average in weight about 90 tons. Six enormous stones weighing 90, 90 tons. Remember, they can lift only today 20 tons and have a vertical joint, some other smaller stones. The, small, the stone quarry is named Cachicata Salt Slope and is located two and a half miles away on the other side of the valley. So they had to go across the valley two and a half miles, moving 90 tons, six rocks weighing 90 tons each. How did they do it? We don't know. In nearby Saskatchewan, one finds similar megalith stone fittings so closely together that you cannot fit a knife in between, just like the pyramids in Egypt. The regular fashion, which the regular fashion which they fit together, makes for a solid earthquake-proof construction, which stands still today. Engineering marvels, no doubt. In Puma Punca, uh, in Bolivia, is another strange place. Uh, it's just a jumbled heap of stones destroyed by violent nature catastrophe. One of the largest buildings was made of stone slabs 26 feet long by 16 feet, weighing 400 tons. 400 tons. And then they had interlocking systems. Very complicated in the design. Latch and form sturdy walls that slid into each other. Uh, the complicated shapes which had made it with great accuracy and the fact they had to be moved in such a way that they locked into each other, in particular waypoints again to great... Points again to great architectural knowledge, machinery to cut it, we don't know how, shape and lift and put stones in place, we don't know how they did it. The stone at Puma Punka contains a perfectly straight groove of six millimeters wide in the entire length. Some equidistant holes are drilled into it. What do they use for drills? Oh, they use stopper, stone and copper tools. They were savages. Bullshit. They were advanced species. Uh, and then here down here, stones at Puma Punka. Were held together by these joints with metal was poured, serving as a clamp. Clamps were made of copper, which is too soft to serve as a clamp. The, the only reason for these clamps is either symbolic or energetic. They use the energy of the copper, folks. Clamps were also used in Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, and Cambodia. They use the same technology. All right, let's get over to the United States. Let's, let's go to Montana. Uh, look at these marvels here. Um, <laughs> I have no words to explain how they did this. I mean, can you imagine how they lifted those stones up to there? The woman being maybe five and a half feet. I mean, those stones perched directly on top of that rock. How did they put that big stone slab on top of that Tizer Dolmen in Montana? I mean, it's beyond description what they're, they were able to do back in the ancient days. The tower at the Giants playground. They said, oh, there were giants that lifted it. Maybe there were. Maybe there weren't. But look at these structures, folks. How did they lift these huge, massive stones? And why aren't we be taught about why aren't we being taught about the ancients having vast superior technology, vast superior knowledge, that they were able to tap into Earth's energies and use Earth's energies as part of healing Earth and themselves as well. I mean, how did they move these stones? Can you imagine just lifting that rock up with a bunch of men and rope, which they tell us how they built the pyramids? Are you crazy? So look at the, how, you know, this could have been something from nature, yes, but there's too much evidence showing how these megaliths around the world, these dolmens, were moved and carried and put in place from places so far away, we have no idea how they did it. Here's some tabletop dolmens. Here's ones that go into caves that have these rocks again. How did they do it? How did they perch them in on top of it? All right. So the bottom line here, we must have respect for our ancients. We can learn from our ancients. We need to learn about Earth's magnetic energies. And this is why the flat Earth topic is so important, because it deals with the ether, the air, which is electromagnetic energy that Nikola Tesla proved again, that once we harness Earth's energy, we can move and lift anything, as I'll show you in a Michael uh, Tellinger piece, where he's working on showing how levitation, vibration, and frequency works with stones. He's done magnificent work with that. All right, so plain truth out. Catch you in the next video. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope it keeps your mind wondering and let you know that we are on an up curve towards knowledge, higher consciousness. And once we develop the higher consciousness as fully realized and develop humans, we will be able to lift these stones as well ourselves and work in harmony with Earth's frequencies and Earth's nature's ways. Plain truth out. Catch you in the next video. Thank you. Peace.